Uh, I am Dr. Bradley Merg. I'm the Provost and Vice Rector of Paragon International University here in Phnom Penh. And it gives me great honor this morning uh, to welcome everyone attending in this first inaugural uh, Benny Widyoto Memorial Lecture, uh, co-hosted with the Center for Khmer Studies. Um, originally, we had hoped to be able to do this as a hybrid format with students in the room at Paragon uh, here in Phnom Penh, as well as with uh, participants joining us online. Unfortunately, due to the COVID situation, we've had to shift to an online format, um, but I do, not, I, do not, I do not think that will in any way impede the discussion that we are going to have today uh, on this very important topic. Um, the memorial lecture is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Benny Widyono, former head of UNTAC in Siem Reap, United Nations Transitional Authority for Cambodia, um, UN Secretary General's representative in Cambodia, Professor of Economics and Politics, and distinct, distinguished board member of the Center for Khmer Studies. Um, today, in this inaugural lecture, we are very honored to have with us um, Pro Professor Dr. Sorpong Pyu, who is Professor of Global uh, Peace and Security Studies at Ryerson University in Toronto, uh, who will be delivering this inaugural lecture titled Post Cold War Peace, Commission, uh, Peace Missions Assessing Untax Legacies. Obviously, this is an incredibly salient topic. Uh, not just as last year we marked the 30th anniversary of the Paris Peace Agreements, uh, but today as we continue to examine questions of the roles of peacekeeping and their long-term legacies for political development as well as for long-term peace and security. Um, with that brief introduction, please allow me to turn the floor over to Dr. Eve Zucker from the Center for Khmer Studies. Dr. Zucker, please. Good evening, everyone, and good morning in Cambodia. Um, I see we have guests here from uh, some people here in the US and, and some people um, also uh, in, obviously in, in Cambodia and I'm sure other places as well. So we're thrilled that you could all make it tonight and we're absolutely thrilled that we actually have several members of the Widiono family here with us tonight as well, including Benny Widiono's wife, uh, Francesca Widiono. And, um, and also several of um, their four children. Um, so we're absolutely delighted. Um, I just wanted to, I'm gonna keep this very brief to give more time to our wonderful speaker that we have here tonight, Dr. So Sorping Poo, who um, will be delivering our first inaugural talk for the Benny Memorial Lecture. Um, and I just wanted to say just a few words about uh, Benny before we started. Um, some of you, probably know him and met him and those who have would know what an absolutely remarkable man uh, Benny, Benny was. Um, he was known for his wit, his charm, his vast knowledge, and of course uh, his humor and his love of life. And one of the things that Benny loved more than anything was um, being able to, to talk to students, um, engage students. He not only um, spoke to students um, in lectures that he would give in Cambodia, but he also taught at the um, University of Connecticut here in, here in Stanford um, as well. And I, I've attended many of his talks. We, we did a number of speaking engagements actually together. And you know his talks were, we're always riveting, we're always full of passion, and always, of course, with his, his characteristic um, humor as well. Um, those of you who, who don't would also know that Benny absolutely had a great love of Cambodia. It was very, very dear to his heart, both Cambodia as a nation and Cambodia and the Cambodian people as well. And, and to that end, um, in addition to the time he served in Cambodia through the UN, um, he also served you know, on the board for several years um, on the Center for Khmer Studies and also the People's Improvement uh, Organization as well, um, he, uh, which, was, which works with uh, orphans in Cambodia. Um, so I, didn't, I don't wanna to say too much because I wanna give some time here to the speakers but just to say that I believe that he would be absolutely thrilled to know uh, that this event is being held tonight and that it's being held at Paragon University, which when it was called Zaman, he used to mention it all the time and would speak very highly of it. And, I, and, um, and he would be delighted with the, the speaker, of course, and the topic, which is of course, um, very close to his own background um, and interest. So, uh, 
I'd just like to thank you all once again and turn it over now to Dr. Uh, Dr. Poe. Okay. Well, greetings from Toronto um, to all of you and thank you, uh, Dr. Merck and Dr. Zaku for uh, your introduction. Uh, it is a, a real pleasure for me to be able to, to be invited to speak, uh, you know, uh, on the role of UNTAC, which Dr. Benny with you know, play a very important role. And uh, I have, uh, I have the honor of getting to know him, uh, not very, very closely, but close enough um, to be able to have chats with him uh, several times. So it's a, it's a pleasure for me to, to, to speak uh, about the topic which he held dear uh, you know, during his time in Cambodia. Um, so let me start by showing you, some, uh, you know, my, my outline. Um, Yeah, I, I have to say that overall, I was quite positive about the role of Puntak. Um, so my, my argument is that Puntak was not perfect, was not as effective as it should have been. But overall, it has uh, some real positive uh, impact and legacy in, on Cambodian in, in Cambodia. But there are also negative legacies as well. So I will be talking about both. But let me start by saying that, you know, again, I know Dr. Uh, Benny uh, uh, well enough to say that I have a lot of respect for him. I, I really like him a lot. Um, it, I, find him, I found him easy to talk to. Uh, as, and as academic, we, we can chit chat and, and, and uh, have a good always had a good conversation. Um, his position on, on Cambodia is quite positive. His position on, on UNTAC was quite favorable, uh, a bit different from the position that I took, but nevertheless, I, I, I have a lot of respect for him. So I am going to talk a little bit about my perspective on UNTAC as, as, a, as an academic. You know, I just, uh, by way of, of giving you a little historical background, a light background. Um, I left Cambodia in 1979, and I returned to Cambodia in 1992 uh, to conduct research on UNTAC. So that's how, that's when I began to get to know a lot of UNTAC uh, official. Um, and uh, so my, my first book uh, was, a, was, was a case that UNTAC was a case study in my first book uh, called Conflict Neutralization in the Cambodian War from Battlefield to Battle Box. So it was published in 1997 by Oxford University Press. But after that, I began to write more on Cambodia, but with a focus more on the role of, of the international community or external actors. So I wrote a book on intervention and change in Cambodia and then I wrote another book on international democracies, a system for peace building Cambodia and beyond. Then uh, more recently in 2020, I co-authored a book with a professor in Seoul and a professor in Tokyo on UN governance, human security in Cambodia and East Timor. So just to give you a little bit background about what I have done. And uh, there's so much to talk about and uh, the aftermath and, and what's happening uh, today. There's just so much to talk about. So I'm not going to be able to discuss anything in detail, but just to say that uh, what I'm going to say is based largely on the co-authored book on UN governance. And that is, uh, that's what I'm going to say uh, about it. Um, you know, I, I have to confess that when uh, I always, as a, as a scholar, I always ask a very simple question, you know, do things work as intended and why? Uh, and that has always been my 
uh, research question uh, with regard to UNTAC as well. Did UNTAC work effectively or perform effectively as intended and why? So I'm trying to highlight a few points here, uh, you know, but I just want to make clear to everybody that, you know, um, I, I always take the position as, you know, as a political scientist who is not interested in politics. I don't want to get involved in politics because for me, it's important for me to step back, stand back, and look at things objectively without being partisan. So in that sense, I, I hope that what I'm trying to say here is based on my objective analysis and, and uh, I don't want to sound partisan. Uh, I don't want to sound biased because that's not what I try to do in, in, in my academic work. Um, and, uh, and as I said, you know, my way of thinking is different from many scholars simply because, uh, because I grew up in Cambodia during the Civil War and I also survived the Khmer Rouge killing field. So my perspective is different from almost everybody that has written on Cambodia. Uh, I remember during the 1980s, the late 1980s, there was a lot of debate about Cambodia, the peace process and all of that stuff. And uh, the three or four broad theoretical approaches or approaches to uh, the, 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 the Cambodia conflict. And that is, you know, include, the, those approaches include culturalism, what I call culturalism, uh, include legalism, and, and also um, uh, um, uh, mor moralism, that's what I call moralism. But my, because of my background, I tend to focus more on security issues rather than talk about culture or morality or legal issues. So that's what I, I always, uh, have always tried to do in my work. So I just want to get everybody uh, a sense of where I came from. So as I said, the 1990s, uh, at the 90, late, late 1980s, there was a lot of debate about the peace process in Cambodia. And my first uh, co-edited book or volumes called Cambodia at the 1989 Paris Peace Conference, published in 1991. So when we talk about the role of UNTAC, we have to go back to the, the, the peace process, to the Paris Peace Agreement, as Dr. Uh, Merck um, mentioned. Um, so um, let me see. So, so it's the Paris Peace Agreement that, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, led to the establishment of UNTAC. And I don't want to get into detail of what the, the different components of UNTAC uh, are or were, but just to say that UNTAC has seven uh, components. And that's why I talk about peacekeeping and peace building at the same time, because it's, it's uh, the, the whole uh, peace operation after the end of the Cold War was, uh, was you know, uh, 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 was not based on peacekeeping alone. It, it was based on uh, peace building. When, when we define peace building, we are talking about human rights, we're talking about election, we're talking about economic reconstruction and things like that. So uh, all in one, peacekeeping and peace building together uh, in the same mission. Um, so, uh, I would say in all my work, I tend to, to, to see the PRS Peace Agreement and the role of UNTA uh, in the following way. And that is what I call a triple transition uh, from war to negative peace. Uh, by that, I mean from you know, uh, the conflict to the end of the conflict and the, the end of the war that was fought by different factions and uh, the Viet, uh, in Vietnam being a, a major actor there in Cambodia. So, so when we talk about negative peace uh, from, from war to peace, I mean, I, 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 I take it to mean that peace is defined in, in negative terms. So, so from war to negative peace, um, there were different Cambodian factions, four of them, uh, uh, you know, uh, because of the time constraint, I would not be able to uh, uh, explain each one of them. But the role of 
untuk and part of the earlier process in the whole operation was uh, was carried out by UNAMIC, uh, the military mission to disarm and demobilize and demand and all of that in Cambodia. And uh, so, so you, you have uh, part of this triple transition from war to negative peace, but you also have uh, another transition, what I call it from authoritarianism to democracy, or you know, initially before I used to say from dictatorship to democracy. And that is part of what I call it positive peace. Untak role in organizing, holding a national election and promote human rights and things like that. Uh, um, and also the, the third dimension of that transition is from what I call it poverty to prosperity through economic reconstruction and development. Uh, that, also, that included uh, repatriation, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and that's also part of positive peace. And I would say these two dimensions uh, are part of what I call peace building. Um, so uh, why was the peace accord possible when the uh, Cameroon factions and 18 other nations or states assigned the Paris Peace Agreement in 1991? I would say it was the end of the Cold War, big power politics, uh, uh, you know, um, took a, 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 a turning point and uh, there was more cooperation, especially between the, the five permanent members uh, at the Security Council. So uh, the Cameroon peace process began as a result of, of, of great power co cooperation. Um, and uh, ASEAN countries, the ASEAN countries that were involved in the, on the diplomatic front, as well as in terms of providing support to uh, some parties, especially the uh, CJDK, uh, the Coalition Government of Democratic Cambodia, uh, ASEAN was not also not interested in seeing the war continue. So you have these external factors but at the same time, we have to keep in mind because a lot of people don't understand, uh, don't, don't miss this point is that what I say, the, the peace agreement was not possible without some kind of political or uh, what I call political military statement on the ground. Uh, that is to say that the power structure uh, at the time were less, were much less asymmetrical than what exists today, uh, right? Uh, so th there was a, political military stalemate in Cambodia among the, the various factions, and none of them could destroy the others. And that's, that's a major factor, in, for, from my perspective, in uh, pushing the Cambodian factions to find a solution. Um, so uh, so the, the, the idea of this triple transition provided a basis for, of my critical assessment of UNTAC performance. So if you want to assess if I want to assess uh, the UNTAC legacy, I have to look at uh, how successful has the triple transition been um, so far. But I would say there are positive, negative, uh, positive legacies as well as negative legacies. One of the positive legacy include, you know, the constitution, for instance, uh, one of the most liberal constitution in, in Asia. And uh, another positive development was that our legacy was that Cambodia rejoined the international community, uh, uh, became you know, recognized by the United Nations, the donor community got involved, ASEAN uh, helped out, and Cambodia became um, a member of ASEAN. And that's part of the whole peace process. Um, and, and that is uh, amazing to me that, that Cambodia uh, you know, has come this far. Um, uh, but also, the social economic dimensions of the peace process uh, uh, is quite remarkable. Educational institution, for instance, uh, you, you have seen a lot of smart Cambodian today. I went to, back to Cambodia each time I went to Cam I go back to, I went back to Cambodia. I met you know PhDs and very really well educated, very smart young Cambodian people, uh, ed well educated and 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 articulate and 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 can do research, can write, can can publish. So, so, so in that sense, uh, UNTAC has left a very important positive legacy for Cambodia in terms of education, but also economic growth. 
uh, economic growth. Uh, you know, Cambodia was dirt poor uh, in the 1980s and, and 90, we, we, we don't have to mention the, 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 the Khmer Rouge period, but the 1980s Cambodia, the economy was not uh, doing that well. So now between 1998 to 2019, for instance, you have uh, a very, a very impressive economic growth rate. So we all know, I don't want to get into this because you know better than me, uh, because you now, most of you are in Cambodia, you know that in terms of economic uh, growth and development, uh, it has been quite impressive. In terms of poverty rate, this is just to, to, to mention a few examples, uh, you know, because of the UN involvement in Cambodia uh, and, and after that, the donor community. So, you know, poverty used to be, you know, 50%, 48%, something like that in the early 1980, in the early, early 1990s. Now you, you know, the poverty uh, rate is down to roughly 17%, 18%. So I, I want to say that, oh, you know, there have been good positive uh, 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 legacy uh, from UNTAC onward. Um, the elections was another important legacy uh, in terms of, you know, I, I was one of the uh, scholars who wrote, uh, you know, in praise of, of the 1993 elections. And I consider it to be relatively, rel relatively free and fair. Um, I went around to poll stations. I talked to people at different poll stations when I was there. Uh, you know, doing my research and talking to people. And so that's another, you know, important legacy. But I also would, would say that partial peace or partial negative peace in the sense that the, you know, the, the armed conflict did not end uh, after 1993, but it was minimized. Uh, only the Khmer Rouge that did not participate in the electoral process, um, you know, rebelled against the government. But the coalition government, to me, formed after the election in 1993, was, uh, was, uh, was a good thing. And so for me, uh, that led to the reduction of, uh, of armed conflict in Cambodia. That's why I call it partial negative peace. Uh, so, uh, but the Khmer Rouge uh, rebellion uh, did not end until 1998, as we all know. And I have to say that the Cambodian government uh, deserve uh, credit for uh, the negotiation that led to the end of the Khmer Rouge uh, uh, rebellion or the beginning of the Khmer Rouge disintegration or collapse. And that was a fantastic development. So, so all of these positive developments uh, uh, or positive legacy should be, um, should be highlighted but there are some negative legacy as well. We can discuss some more, but I would say that uh, the, the most challenging aspect of UNTAC was the failure to disarm the, uh, the four armed factions um, uh, for various reasons. We can talk about it as well, but uh, uh, you know, the disarmament process uh, uh, failed completely. Uh, the four sig Cambodian signatories, signatories did not uh, uh, refuse to disarm. And the Khmer Rouge was the, the main culprit, but uh, because the Khmer Rouge refused to disarm, uh, other party, the other parties also followed suit, refusing to disarm as well. Uh, and uh, I can explain why the Khmer Rouge did not want this disarm. We all know what they did to have in Cambodia. And the fact that if you disarm, you would put yourself in the position of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, of uh, danger. Uh, and was, uh, it was quite, for me, predictable that the Khmer Rouge would not disarm. And as a result, the disarmament process failed completely. Um, so, uh, and, and, and also, um, UNTAC, I would say, I want to add it here because I didn't, uh, uh, I, uh, let me see, um, uh, did not uh, succeed in taking control of the, uh, the SOC, the state of Cambodia's uh, uh, administrative structures. And as a result, there was a lot of 
mistrust and distrust about the ability to uh, create an, a, a neutral environment for free and fair election. So um, uh, as a result of that, uh, what you end up was that the UNTAC, I would say overall uh, failure was its inability to transform the power structure in Cambodia. Um, so the uh, uh, resistant movement uh, or CJDK broke into different factions and, uh, but this, uh, the SOC, so CPP remained intact and strong. And as a result, uh, the power structure shifted in favor of the CPP and making uh, the CPP stronger than the other individual uh, political parties. And what, that's what I, 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 I said in all my work that that gave rise to the uh, emergence of a hegemonic power structure or the hegemonic party system. Um, the CPP has become the dominant party because of the fact that the CJDK broke into different parties and um, they were also divided uh, among themselves and within the parties. And uh, in my work, I explain why the, um, uh, why the, uh, the CPP has been very successful in consolidating power as a result of uh, uh, you know, uh, what happened after UNTAC, uh, uh, after UNTAC intervention in Cambodia. Um, so another, another uh, negative legacy, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say negative to the extent that it is really something that uh, UNTAC could have done but the rule of law in Cambodia is has been not particularly, uh, not particularly uh, promising or not particularly uh, positive in a sense that, you know, um, I have read reports about the rule of law and Cambodia has never ranked uh, very high when it comes to rule of law institution building. Um, uh, in terms of human rights and, and, and things like that. But overall, Cambodia still ranked quite low among nine, uh, this number, 138 out of 190, uh, 139 countries, just better than uh, Venezuela. My, I think I'm skeptical about this assessment, the World Project, uh, the World Justice uh, Project, Rule of Law in, uh, Project, I am a bit skeptical because I don't think it's fair. I don't think that Cambodia, I would not rank Cambodia that low, but that does not mean that, uh, you know, uh, Cambodia has done very well on, on the rule of law front. So in that sense, when it comes to uh, democracy, human rights and, and rule of law, uh, Cambodia have in fact regressed and have not moved forward at all. So I would say that has a lot to do with the, uh, the, the inability to transform the political power structure. And as a result, what you have today is uh, a hegemonic party system in which one party dominates. Uh, and and uh, it's, it, it, the system allows, you know, other parties to exist. But uh, but none of the opposition party can be assumed to be able to compete uh, fairly and effectively. So in other words, when we talk about democratization, democracy and all of that, we have to look at pattern. We look, you know, so, so in other words, um, Cambodia is, a, is, is, from my perspective, is not moving toward democracy. We can no longer call Cambodia a democracy. Um, but, but having said that, there is a degree of stability, but that kind of stability is also fragile. Um, I, we can discuss that. So uh, to, um, to elaborate on what might happen in the future, uh, it doesn't look like you know, Cambodia is going to, be, uh, to um, restore democracy anytime soon based on my understanding of the power structure in, in Cambodia. And uh, so the conclusion that I wanna make is this, is that, you know, uh, UNTAC overall 
perform, you know, not as effectively as it should have from my perspective. Um, I would say, you know, 65% of what had been intended uh, for, uh, for UNTAC to achieve, but, but, uh, but, you know, uh, overall, it's, it's, it's more positive than negative. Um, as I said, in terms of legal framework, economic uh, reconstruction development, but even economic development, there is a concern about sustainability, environmental sustainability, um, and it's something to, to watch uh, in the years to come. Um, peace, yes, negative peace, but it's still not uh, without positive peace, it's still unsustainable. Uh, that's the concern I have. In other words, the hegemonic power, uh, the hegemonic party system is, is temporarily stable, but it's prone to tension and instability. That's how I see it. Um, um, uh, again, the, you know, that goes back to um, how UNTAC performed uh, in the, the two year period that UNTAC was in Cambodia. Uh, I, I would say the failure of disarmament, as I pointed out, um, and the inability to take charge of the uh, SOC uh, civilian uh, administrative structure. So um, overall, I, 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 I remember very really well when I talked to Dr. Vidyono, uh, he always said to me, so Pong, Cambodia is now a normal developing country. Right, so I agree with him. Cambodia is a normal developing country and making progress on the social economic front, but politically and 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 and, and uh, in terms of rule of law, it's still far behind. There is a there is a, there's a lot of room for improvement on that front. Um, so uh, let me conclude by asking this question: Who is to blame for all the things that have not gone right in Cambodia. No, I don't like to blame anyone in, uh, you know, my, my work, I never try to blame anyone. All I try to do is to ask people to think what, how, why things went wrong, or why things go wrong. Um, uh, so I don't blame Onta either, uh, given the fact that, uh, you, know, you know, I know how the United Nations works. <laughs> Uh, my new book on global public governance deal a lot with the United Nations um, and, and you know the question about world government and all of that. So I, I understand that you know you cannot blame a peace mission uh, when the uh, the whole United Nations system was not uh, was not uh, was not that great, was not effective. So I don't blame UNTAC either, but we have to look back and, and say, okay, what did UNTAC could, uh, what could UNTAC have done better? I would say that in the 19, early 1990s, a lot, of, a lot of people who study peacekeeping and peace building put less emphasis on, put less emphasis on security issue. They tend to assume that if you have a peace agreement, then the, the, the uh, signatories will, will work together, will keep the peace, will, build, uh, will respect the ceasefire and all of that. What they, what from my perspective is that uh, a lot of people who have written or wrote at the time about UN peace operation was that they overlooked the security challenges in places like Cambodia, war-torn countries. So that's why my work is different in the sense that I don't blame people. I don't uh, look at culture. I, I am critical of the cultural uh, approach to peace building, peacekeeping. Assuming that, oh, people are like that, they will always behave like that. Uh, leaders are authoritarian, so they will never change. Uh, that kind of uh, analysis uh, is not helpful to me. Uh, as, as a survivor of the Khmer Rouge Killing Field, who grew, also grew up during the Civil War, I always look at security issues. Uh, the problem in places like Cambodia is that unless security is guaranteed, people will not disarm. People will not stop maximizing power. People will not, uh, you know, struggle for control. 
And that is the problem in Cambodia. So you cannot just talk about morality. People can't, don't understand if you talk about moral issues. And a lot of people like to talk about who's right, who's wrong, who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. I don't, in, uh, in my work, I don't get involved in that kind of uh, analysis because I think it's not productive, it's not helpful because you have to look at people's fear. You have to look at people's security concern. You have to look at the problem of power, the problem of insecurity. So I tend to look at power structure and determine and then identify security issue. So I don't blame anyone uh, in my work, but I, I, I just want to draw people attention to the fact that if you are in that situation, if you always talk about who's the guy, bad guy, who's the good guy, who's right, who's wrong, uh, uh, you're not going to go very far until you address security concerns that each party had. So I think uh, uh, my, my new book called author book on UN governance, we uh, identified a shift from you know, the early 1990s where people, UN peace, uh, keepers or, 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 or uh, uh, experts who, who, who talk about you know, uh, peacekeeping and peace building, you know, there's a shift of emphasis toward security. I think they need to put more emphasis on security and not on morality, not on uh, 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 not on legal issues, because legal issue tend to, to lead to punitive measure. If you have, uh, uh, that's why I always try to shift attention away from uh, putting too much emphasis on the culture of impunity. I always say, let's shift more toward the culture of retribution. Uh, you know, throughout recent history, Cambodia had, 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 had waged war against each other, different factions uh, fought each other. Um, I remember, just to conclude, because of the time constraint here, just to conclude, I always remember this. When the Khmer Rouge came in in 1975, my father worked for, was an, a, a government official working for the Ministry of Interior, and my father was a gentle soul. So when the Khmer Rouge came in, uh, to that area where my father worked, they asked my father to have this farm, the Khmer Rouge. And my father did that. My father uh, participated in the process of getting soldiers and police to disarm. But what happened after the dis disarmament? They rounded my father up and his colleagues and executed all of them. So I've learned that lesson that, that it's not easy to just say, okay, go ahead and disarm and everything is going to go for well for you. I've learned that lesson and I say, why is it that if you don't pay attention to the security dynamics in countries like Cambodia, you're not going to be very successful. And that's why all my work has been about security, 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 and I put a lot more emphasis on the politics of survival. And a lot of people still don't understand, uh, from my perspective, that security is more important than just simply paying attention to culture, to morality, to issue like that. The moment we just talk about law and uh, morality and things like that, we miss out the most important point uh, that makes it difficult for countries like Cambodia to move ahead. So, Let's uh, let let's celebrate the work of UNTAC, but at the same time, uh, we should also acknowledge the limits of what the international community or the United Nations can do to help to help um, countries like Cambodia and Cambodian themselves need to understand the problem, the security dynamic, rather than blaming each other all the time. So I hope um, you know uh, that my talk. Uh, uh, celebrate the work of Dr. Vidyono, uh, all his effort. And uh, as I said, I, I have a lot of respect for him. I like him a lot. Uh, I Especially I like his sense of humor. Um, and let's celebrate what he did for Cambodia, what Untak did for Cambodia, but let's look at Cambodia the problems in Cambodia more objectively uh, by not by paying attention to uh, the security needs 
of, uh, of the Cameroon people, of the political parties, and let's hope we can find common solutions so that we can move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pugh, for an excellent talk. And yes, I, you, you certainly did succeed in terms of giving us uh, both a wonderfully thorough uh, discussion of UNTAC and uh, a very clear uh, security framework uh, there while definitely celebrating uh, the legacy um, of Dr. Benny Widiono. Um, to all of our attendees, just as we move forward, um, a, brief, a brief note on structure. Um, I'm just going to give a few remarks, uh, a short uh, discussant commentary, uh, and uh, just open a few questions uh, and give uh, Dr. Sopong Pew a chance to respond, uh, to expand in some areas where he might want to, uh, his choice. Uh, and then we will open the floor to Q&A and to discussion. Uh, if you are joining us here on Zoom, uh, we already have a couple in. Please feel free to uh, type in a question in the Q&A box. Um, alternatively, if you are joining us via Facebook, uh, please feel free to uh, type in a question there and those will be sent over. Uh, and I will try to get to as many of them as possible uh, in the time allowed. Uh, so we very much look forward to your interaction. Uh, and I promise to be uh, relatively brief uh, so that we can have as much time for discussion as possible. Uh, just a few points that really intrigued me in the talk that I wanted to highlight uh, as potential areas for, for analysis um, the f or for further, further discussion. Um, the first is, is the question of we talk about, and obviously, the, uh, and as was well noted here, um, the, the role of UNTAC and the legacies are still incredibly strong in Cambodia. Uh, as a political economist by training, it's, it's, it's not surprising to me that even uh, nearly three decades ago, we still see impacts in terms of institutional trajectory, uh, in terms of the development of political parties, um, that this really was an enormous critical juncture for Cambodia that still has a huge effects remaining today. At the same time, should we, in the context of 2022 and what we know about peacekeeping, um, can we consider UNTAC um, to be consistent with how we conceptualize peacekeeping today? Um, just in the, in, the, in the context of, as, as, as you well noted, um, there, we didn't really see any uh, full security on the ground at any point. There was, there was, there was no point where there, were the, where there was full disarmament, et cetera. The KR had not given up weapons. And so UNTAC is put in something of a distinct position from later peacekeeping missions uh, in that it doesn't, uh, it, it, where later peacekeeping missions, we have some degree of at least agreement on the ground in the beginning of disarmament or some sort of security equilibrium that seems somewhat stable. Um, it looks as though with uh, UNTAC entry that we were really dealing with, I mean, a false equilibrium or, or no equilibrium at all uh, in light of uh, the KR's lack of willingness to, uh, to move forward. So uh, should we be considering the UNTAC period as something other than peacekeeping? Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it something distinct? Is it really more of a peace building story uh, in that sense? At the same time, uh, as you noted, uh, and the question of the, of the Paris Peace Accords uh, and the broader sort of structural factors uh, that led to those, particularly the end of the Cold War uh, and the lack of any appetite for this conflict to continue here in Southeast Asia. Um, I'm wondering if there's, if, if, there's uh, if, if, we look, if we put it in comparative perspective uh, in the context of uh, post-Soviet societies, post-Cold War societies, uh, places like Transnistria, in contemporary Moldova um, or Nagorno-Karabakh between Azerbaijan and Armenia, I mean, remain these, these intractable frozen conflicts that have continued on since the end of the Cold War. Um, yet Cambodia, um, despite having such enormous complexity, um, still managed to move ahead with the PPAs, managed to move into uh, the UNTAC period uh, successfully and didn't get caught in the stalemate trap that had happened to so many other countries uh, or so many other parts of the world afterwards. Um, are there other variables that might explain um, Cambodia being able to move into that while other places failed? I, I look at it and think of agency questions, particularly the role of His Majesty, the late King Father um, and others uh, that, that played a role. Uh, but it does seem as though Cambodia is, is unique in that sense of, of no, not being one of those uh, part of that laundry list of frozen conflicts uh, that we still confront today. Um, or latent frozen conflicts that uh, we're seeing today uh, in, in, in Ukraine, unfortunately, um, and making peacekeeping even more salient in, in 2022. Um, I'm hoping also as well, the, you could go into a little bit on the question of uh, the inability to take control over state of Cambodia structures. Um, is there, was this at the outset something that uh, in your perspective, especially as someone who is on the ground 
uh, during that time. Uh, was this something that should have been anticipated? Was this something that, uh, or, or, or was this a, a reality of, uh, in light of UNTAC's historic first role, um, was, uh, if, 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 was this something that we really could only see in hindsight? Um, that, there, that, that this was a post hoc uh, realization and that going in, it was simply not going, it was simply not going to be, it was simply not going to be feasible uh, in, terms of, in terms of the long term. Um, I'd also like to uh, just note uh, the, I think the, the, the real importance here of uh, moving away from, and as you know, the sort of cultural or normative framework that people, uh, that, that, that's attached to many of, uh, many analyses and discussion here, and really grounding it in, in the question of, of security uh, and, 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 and framing, it, uh, framing it along those lines, uh, I think is able to move us out of, of quite a bit of extraneous material. Uh, and uh, and into really what the, what sort of the center is. Um, you talk about just my my last point because I do want to open the floor, uh, and I know it's it's also quite quite a lot to respond to. But feel free to, to to choose what you'd like to respond to. This question of fragile stability for Cambodia, if if it is, I'm hoping you might uh, be be able to or be willing to go into a little bit more detail. Um, because there's there, I would say there's there's probably a split in the literature. Uh, I think at this stage in in a lot of contemporary analysis of Cambodia. Um, where some see um, really a deepening uh, a deepening equilibrium um, with uh, the, with the, the with the ruling party with the government, which uh, continues to sort of build positive feedback mechanisms uh, and is able to expand out and institutionalize uh, its power um, not uh, throughout the country uh, and uh, has has and many uh, many analysts view that as as, as uh, a very significant achievement in terms of regime uh, consolidation. Again, not bringing in normative questions here, just in, in straight political science terms. Um, or is it, or are we really looking at um, a, a continued story throughout, a story of, of just sort of constant fragile stability, constant unstable equilibrium um, as Cambodia has gone through its, uh, its, its post Paris Peace Accords uh, political development? Um, and if so, is there any, obviously there's no panacea, there's no magic bullet that, that creates uh, well reinforcing equilibria, um, but is there, is there a path out of it or a path uh, that would at least bring us a higher level of stability uh, and predictability? Uh, so with that, please, uh, let me turn the floor back over. Uh, again, ample uh, there, please, it's up to you, sir, what you'd like to respond to. Uh, let me turn over the floor to Dr. Pugh. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pugh. Um, lots of good questions, need a lot of time to discuss, um, and probably not just time to discuss, but the time to do more research. <laughs> um, obviously, the first question about peacekeeping, peace building, I think uh, the problem in Cambodia is that, um, you know, I think uh, the UNTAC as a peace mission tried to do both, sim almost simultaneously, and that's the problem. You don't you don't move from you know peacekeeping and then to you know have a break and then move to peace building. Although peace building has been going on since then until now, it's it's still you know uh, an ongoing peace building process. Uh, I I think uh, the, in the early 1990s, as I said, uh, the UN peace mission to Cambodia was uh, unprecedented in the largest, but inexperienced, I would say. You know. Uh, Budu Budrugali come up with this idea of peace building, peacekeeping, peacemaking, and all of that stuff. Cambodia was an experiment <laughs> for, for UNTAC. And, that, and that's why I don't want to blame UNT, uh, the UN or UNTAC, knowing the challenges that it faced at the time, knowing that this is novel, this is new, this is a, a, something that the UN had not really done before. So, uh, the fact that the UN was willing to help Cameroon out for me that's important to me um, but but we uh, you know um, um, uh, but I, I I would say that the, U, the UN or uh, UNTA tried to do a lot with with less <laughs> resources few resources and was ambitious but not understood I, I don't want to say that UNTA people don't understand I, I, I try to avoid it but having live in Cambodia knowing the situation, knowing the security problems, uh, uh, the peacekeeping component was not that effective. Uh, and that we can discuss some more about it. You know, in spite of the fact that the peacekeeping component had about 15,000 troops, right? 
but it took more than a year for, uh, for uh, the full deployment. Right? So by that time, you know, the Camaros in particular was wondering, what is your own target doing here, right? Uh, so uh, I think a lot of the, the, the political parties have sort of lost trust already, confidence in Untak's ability to keep the peace. And that's why the Khmerus would not, knowing that, you know, especially the Khmer Rouge, you know, knowing what they did in the past, <laughs> would never want to disarm uh, in that kind of condition. And especially when you, you're talking about election, liberal election, meaning that there will be winners and losers. Uh, and you disarm, you, you disarm and you lost. What would happen to you? Let's go back to the security question that I raised earlier. Now, in terms of comparative perspective, you know, I, I think you raise a very important point, but it needs to do uh, to need more research on this, right? Comparatively, but the advantage that Cambodia had at the time is that the political parties, the political faction, were so dependent on external actors, right? The CJDK depend on China and uh, you know the Soviet Union, Vietnam on 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 the sea. Uh, on the south uh, side, heavy dependent uh, when these great powers said, that's it, we don't want to, to, to help you guys out anymore. You know, you don't have a lot of choice, right? Uh, uh, and that's why uh, I think the pressure from the Security Council, from the, the P5 was effective in the Cameroon case. Uh, I don't know about other cases, how much the great powers or great powers got involved, right? and how much dependence the, the warring factions had on external powers. The pressure is, is great um, because the, the, the Soviet Union or Russia, uh, China uh, had all kinds, of, all kinds of political interests in stopping the war in Cambodia. And I wrote, uh, I, I discuss it in detail in the book on UN governance. So, you know, you, 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 people should read it a bit more. <laughs> Sorry to sell my book, but to, to promote my book, but, but you know, uh, it, it just so much to discuss about the diplomatic front uh, during that period, the 1980s, the late 1980s, you know, the, the uh, diplomatic shuttle between uh, uh, that, uh, between uh, uh, shuttle diplomacy that it was called, you know, um, uh, Soviet leaders and uh, Chinese leaders and United States and France and all of that. So there was a consensus, more or less. The P uh, the P five read consensus, and that's why I think that was unique in the case of Cambodia. Uh, the role of King Sihanouk, uh, yes, he played a very important role, but I would say that uh, uh, I think his 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 role was positive in the domestic context in terms of being the someone that can be you know respected and recognized by the very the, the, uh, the warring faction so he had played that role that's why he was chosen to be this the, the the chairman of the supreme national council right so he's he's the most popular Cambodian politician uh, in cambodia so he did play a role a positive role so yes uh, but i would say i would say that the fact that the warring factions could not also eliminate each other at that time, at that moment, there's a military stalemate. The idea that some people, uh, Laurie Dong, the, uh, the commander of UNAMIC, said that we well, let's let's start a war with the Khmer Rouge, let's sacrifice uh, a few hundred UN peacekeepers. That's nonsense. Uh, the Vietnamese could not destroy <laughs> after ten years, could not destroy the Khmer Rouge and the CJDK. Why would the UN peacekeepers that 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 came from different countries? And, and and not well coordinated, well organized, go and destroy the Khmer Rouge. But that, for me, that's what a lunacy. Uh, to be honest with you, so I am the one who always I was one of the few people who always talk about, you know, power structure. Uh, in that sense, maybe Dr. Merck and you, me, you and I can agree on something because I'm I'm more realist inclined uh, my, in my way of thinking. Is that you have to uh, also accept you know, um, a degree of realism in, in when you, you want to do something, don't do it. And, and that's why my book, coming book on, um, on global public governance to what will government, it's a critic of idealism. Idealism can be counterproductive and can be destructive, all right? The Khmer Rouge, I, I lived in Cambodia during that period. 
It was all about turning Cambodia into a utopian of that kind of idealism, destructive. And that's why I became more realist inclined in that sense. So, so uh, yeah, Cambodia, the, the Cambodian situation was probably unique at that time, but at the same time, the UN was inexperienced either. Right? It was not experienced either. So I would say, yeah, um, I don't think Udak was in a position to take control of the SOX uh, administrative structure. <laughs> to start with, you know, uh, civilian personnel who were slowly deployed, small in numbers, and, uh, you know, the SOC was the most powerful <laughs> party at the time. When the SOC said, no, you can't, you can't. And so in that sense, no matter what uh, UNTAC wanted to do, uh, when there is no cooperation, cooperation from uh, the SOC, you couldn't do anything, really. Uh, and that is, you know, but there, there, this is a consensus among scholars that one of the UNTAC's inability, inability to, to really um, uh, create a neutral environment for free and fair election. But luckily, luckily, the election went better than expected. I would say relatively free and fair election. So in terms of cultural issues, um, yeah, I don't, I'm not exactly uh, sure what you, how you tie uh, cultural issue to security, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, at the time, uh, in the 1980s, I remember having a debate with some scholars, uh, they always tend to say, oh, Cambodia has, a, you know, this authoritarian uh, history and Cambodian leaders are authoritarian. They would never accept democracy as a, as a, as a, as a uh, governing system and all of that. So they would have, some people would say Buddhism is a problem, you know, things like that. So all kinds of things that, but I, I was probably the only one, I would say that knowing Cambodia, having lived in Cambodia was that the fear that, that, that each party had for each other, the fear that even Cambodian, ordinary Cambodian had for each other based on what they have gone through in the past. That's that paramount. Security was paramount, right? Uh, if you interview people, talk to people who survived the Khmer uh, 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 killing fields, you know, people just don't trust each other. That's to start with. And the Khmer factions could not trust each other. The Khmerus in particular could not trust anybody because they know if they disarm, that would be the end of it, right? So uh, uh, just uh, uh, can move on to uh, the question about fragile stability. What that, what I mean by that is that fragile stability, yes, there has been stability, but what I call it hegemonic stability, if you, you will, right? Uh, but the problem of hegemonic stability in Cambodia is that it is personal. <laughs> it's monopolized by one person and it's con it consolidated by one person and that person play a very important role in stabilizing Cambodia. But at the same time, it's not institutionalized. And that is the problem but it's not institutionalized and personalized. What happened when that person died, when that person, you know, is in trouble. And there is always, you know, uh, there is, because of that, there is always an effort to keep consolidating power, right? Consolidating power in, uh, by, not by building institution, but by recruiting people that you can trust to work, to, to help you consolidate power. And that includes family members, right? So. So it's a question of trust um, that, that is highly problematic in Cambodia. So, and I, you know, having known, observed for over the years is that, so even through our history, Cambodian leaders don't trust each other, right? Even Cambodian kings don't trust each other. Remember King Sihanouk, how many bodyguards did he have? Where they came, where did they come from? 25, 27 body, Korean uh, bodyguards from North Korea, right? And, and to be blunt, even Prime Minister Hun Sen has six, seven, five, seven, six thousand bodyguards, right? So it just, it just that you operate in an environment where you cannot trust, you have to consolidate power. And by consolidating power, you not only build, you don't build institution, you personalize it. And that is the problem. That is factual stability. 
And when that happened, what happened if the economic crisis hit? And Cambodian economic growth is commendable, but at the same time, it's not sustainable, especially if the EU posed sanctions. And, you know, Cambodia, the Cambodian economy is, from my understanding of it, was initially heavily aid dependent and then has been basically export driven. So, at the, you know, fantastic economic growth rate, but at the same time, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, it's not sustainable, especially when it comes to the environmental issues, and we have all kinds of problems. So, and above all else, it's the institutional structure. I haven't studied the Cambodian economic structure because I'm not an economist, but based on what I know, is that uh, you know it, it's export dependent, driven, but. Uh, at the moment, the world economy get into trouble, <laughs> Cambodia will, will also uh, have problems. So that's what I mean by factized stability, is that it's not institutionalized, it's not uh, sustainable, it's personalized. So as a result, uh, we have a degree of stability, but that kind, that kind of stability uh, depends on uh, on personal a uh, personal power base and that for me is problematic uh, there's so much we could go into but as, as, as moderator I have to give up my chair as yes. prerogative yeah, yeah. As, a, yes. as a fellow as a fellow realist uh, <laughs> and an institutionalist um, really uh, absolutely enormous amount there and and absolutely fascinating particularly on the stalemate question uh, as well as uh, the question of fragile stability and lack of institutionalization. Uh, and, the, and the challenges that will bring up uh, as Cambodia moves ahead. Um, uh, we have about uh, half an hour or so to go. Uh, let me run through in order just some of the questions that we've gotten. One just uh, to kick off with. Um, some scholars argue that it is uh, difficult for a country like Cambodia to achieve both stability and democracy. Uh, I believe the impl uh, implying is, is uh, what is your view on this argument? Are we, is it really a trade-off between stability and democracy? Yeah. You know, probably there is a trade-off in the initial stage, but um, uh, I, I'm an institutionalist, I, you, you know, in a sense that I believe that even institutionalists from a, with a touch of realism. <laughs> and that means that you have to have checks and balances and, you know, power should not be personalized, but institutionalized based on checks and balances and things like that, right? Because power tend to corrupt and absolute power corrupt absolutely. And that is my belief. And, and, and it's not just someone else, someone, me, I may, you know, I, I, I think human nature has something to do with it. Is that if, if, if I have power unchecked, you know, I tend to be, I would tend to be corrupt. And that's why I, even myself, I need to be checked as well. So I don't, that's why I don't engage in the politics of blame. I don't blame anyone. I just try to say, yes, you need to look at the problems that you have. And the problems that Cambodia has is what I have discussed so far. And that is the personalization of power rather than institutionalization of power. And as a result, everything rests on individual leaders, but what happens if something goes wrong? There's nothing to sustain or to, 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 uh, to uh, keep it going. So there is a trade-off. I would say stability, this is one thing I, I love to, to, to say when I talk to my Cambodian, uh, Cambodian friends uh, about stability and, 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 and institution, right? I always say, you know, Cambodians are not worse than others when it comes to fighting and bickering and politicking. We are not the only people who, who, who have a history of violence against each other. Just look at American today. Look at the United States today. Look at the Democrats and Republicans. But what keep them from, you know, taking up guns and shoot at each other is that the, the American system is institutionalized to the extent that it's so mature that the rule of law is still strong that people don't go to an extreme, too extreme. Even if they go to an extreme on a personal level, they can't. They can't, you know, take the gun and shoot people, right? 
But when a country that is that that is institutionally weak or fragile, that's when the personal aspect of power politics comes in, and that's when it's it's in, unstable, it's it's fragile, and so I always say that you know. Uh, Cambodian people, we need to look at our common problems. Stop blaming each other. Stop looking at who is the bad guy, good guy. Start thinking about how can we work together to build institutions to help us consolidate peace and sustain peace. Otherwise, we're going to demonize each other. American politics today, people demonize each other nonstop. You know, it's just heartbreaking looking at American politics today. But it's not going to, you know, there's no civil war yet. It might be civil war someday, I don't know, but uh, that at least there is stability, institutionalized stability, right? So we need to think about, okay, maybe there is a need for stability without serious institutionalization. But at some point, you really need to start building institutions that sustain peace and stability. Otherwise, it's not going to, to last. History will just go in full circle, uh, circle right? Uh, war, peace, peace, war, war, peace, conflict, conflict. That's what I mean by fragile stability, instability. Oh, thank you so much. There's so much we could get into there. I mean, just this, the, the salience of the question uh, that, I mean, we're confronting not just in Cambodia, but throughout Southeast Asia and globally of uh, how do we institutionalize and how, how and, and, and do that? I mean, it's, it's sort of calls to mind former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown's uh, famous comment of, yes, England built the rule of law. Uh, it just took us 500 years. Uh, yeah. We couldn't tell you how we did yeah, it, yeah. but it took us 500 yeah. years. Yeah, um, yeah. Let me let me, uh, let me me yield over to our next question. I'm just, uh, and this uh, bill uh, uh, from uh, George Chigas, uh, and uh, who uh, is consistent with you, with your uh, discussion uh, about uh, say, uh, SOC and uh, domination of the power structure. Uh, let me just uh, give it in, uh, read it out uh, fully. Um, yeah. Was it not predictable or expected that UNTAC would not reconfigure SOC CPP domination of the power structure, uh, given that the SOC built and maintained that dominant position over the 1980s and early 1990s. To the contrary, didn't the SOC successfully manipulate the peacekeeping process and outmaneuver the international and local players to its own advantage? Uh, continuing on with the comment, fortunately the overall result, as you say, has been negative peace and positive economic development um, the expectation that the political system would be transformed uh, from its historical model of authoritarianism to a multi-party democratic system with peaceful transfer of power following elections was unfounded without a historical president or the requisite existing democratic institutions. Again, echoing, echoing your comments on institutionalization uh, and, and the challenges thereof in, 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 the, in their construction. Mm -hmm. um, thoughts on, thoughts on expanding on this point, sir? Yes, uh, you know, I would say that, um, you know, uh, the Paris Peace Agreement was based on the assumption that, you know, the Cameroon uh, parties or factions were willing to, uh, to cooperate with UNTAC and to work together, right, and to build, rebuild their own country. Um, but that was a flawed assumption, right? Uh, the, the flawed assumption in the sense that it, it, it did not take into account what I call it in my book called insecurity dilemma, right? If you disarm, you, uh, you might lose, you might, you know, uh, uh, who knows in that kind of environment? Because as I mentioned it about my father trying to disarm uh, uh, the Republican government soldiers and after that he was executed, right? So, so my point is simple is that each party try not to lose. And if each party realized it would lose, it would not disarm, right? And the Khmer Rouge is the best example, right? Uh, because you know, uh, the threat of even bringing Khmer Rouge to justice at the time was still there, right? So you don't want to lose in that kind of environment. So I would say the CPP, uh, this is what I call the politics of survival. Uh, is that, you know, it manipulated because, you know, when, when the CPP realized that UNTAC uh, was not very serious in terms of taking effective, quick action, even deploying peacekeepers on time. And, and, and you know, 15,000 is a, is, a, is, a, is a big number <laughs> at the end of the Cold War, but not big enough from my perspective, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and how, might, how many troops did the, the SOC have? Right? 
So uh, comparatively, you know that uh, the SOC <laughs> realized that it could uh, it could also manipulate it, uh, the whole process very easily, right? Um, at the end of the day, the politics of survival uh, uh, ruled. Uh, so in that sense, yes, the CPP, the CPP knew it was not that popular. And I study the, um, the, the, the CPP, the, the, the revolutionary party uh, in the 1980, it was not popular, right? So the CPP itself did not want to lose either. So it, it did what it could to manipulate it, the whole process to, to take charge, to control. And when it lost, it would not want, it did not <laughs> hand over power to the funds in back either. That what, that's how they end up having this coalition government. So for me, the politic of survival in Cambodia at the time and still is, was extreme. Uh, so it's just difficult for the process of trust building. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and at the time also, uh, you know, uh, the politics of demonization too. And I, I talked to a lot of UNTAC officials, uh, people, right, on the ground and, uh, you know, and, and, and they, 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 they are right not to trust the Khmer Rouge, right? And so, you know, who not the Khmer Rouge anyway? None, of, very few not the Khmer Rouge, right? except the Khmerus themselves. So in that sense, the extreme level of survival politics on the part of the Khmerus uh, was highly problematic. So by doing that kind of analysis, you know, you, you can predict who is going to uh, cooperate, who is not going to cooperate. The CPP knew that it could lose, but it had the power to control. It would not submit to UNTAC. Uh, Front impact is too small, <laughs> submitted to UNTAC, but could not go against mm. the SOC, right? So in that sense, there were so many security challenges at the time. Before when the Khmer Rouge, when KP and RF, the Son San Party, when um, uh, Front Simpec were together, they created a more balanced structure of power, right? Uh, but once the coalition government broke apart, it, uh, the coalition government of Democratic Cambodia, CJDK, broke apart. That gave rise to the emergence of the CPP as the dominant power right away, right? That's why it, it accepted a coalition government, but, you know, worked toward consolidating power. And you know what happened in 1997, July 1997, right? And after that, further consolidation of power. But what I said about fragile stability also is the fact that the CPP was, was not united, was fractured. We all know about you know, the friction within the CPP, but the, 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 the prime minister managed to consolidate power by personalizing it. As a result, it, more, it become more unified, but still fragile. One person cannot hold power indefinitely. At some point, it's go he's going to lose the grip on, on power uh, at, at some point. And that's what I mean by personalization of power uh, and not institutionalized of power. Ah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this sort of, I'm actually gonna skip the order a little bit because uh, this is uh, the, the fourth one actually, which has come in in the chat, uh, but it really sort of builds off of, 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 of that question of, of, uh, of, of the politics of, of, of personalism uh, in, in, in regimes of this category. Um, and as the topic has been discussed and is, is now the subject of, of regular announcements and discussion um, here in Cambodia, um, regularly also in the English language media here uh, and also and particularly in the Khmer Times, um, the question um, uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the participant, I would like to have your view on the post uh, Hun Sen era. Uh, given Cambodian politics is so much based on hegemonic stability building on the personality of a single person. Um, will those continue to be what Cambodian politics remain? Uh, mm -hmm. Or are we, uh, and there's a, there's a second, uh, among the, se the sort of second question, I'll just get to the second portion, which is looking really curious about, um, again, the, 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 the idea of a, of a period fo uh, following uh, the, the current rule of the prime minister. I'm asking if this will be likely be reduced, uh, uh, this dynamic of the culture of regime survival, um, should uh, Hun Manet take over, 
uh, in future uh, and asking for your frank assessment of that future uh, in light of those dynamics uh, discussed. These are excellent question. Uh, excellent, excellent question. Um, you know, as I said, it, uh, fragile instability, because uh, everything is not institutionalized. Uh, with the post Hun Sen era, you know, might lead to more instability, right? Because, the, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the, <laughs> I hate to say this, but the, the, the son of Prime Minister Hun Sen is not quite well experienced yet. <laughs> um, and uh, the prime minister has been in power since when? 1979, you know, uh, 83 or 84, 85 as prime minister. Uh, so he has the ability to uh, outmaneuver any opposition challenges I'm not sure if the uh, Manet has that ability to do that. On the other hand, he has the advantage of being the new person, starting from uh, starting fresh. If he can, if he can, if he can get the different Cambodian parties to reach what I saw, what we might want to call it, a new social contract. <laughs> trying to rebuild the countries together by putting more emphasis on institutionalization of power. I think Cambodia has a great chance uh, of, of, rebuild, of rebuilding the country and ensuring more lasting stability. I think it depends on how smart, how skillful you are in terms of getting the different factions together or different parties together. Uh, but at the end of the day, Whoever, whoever, whoever is the leader of Cambodia, you must first and foremost take security challenges into account, meaning that you do not consolidate power by yourself. You really have to be able to share power in such a way that allow other parties to build their own political parties and compete. Um, there must be a soft contract. There must be, it, it's, Peacekeeping is an ongoing process. Uh, peace building is an ongoing process. Uh, leaders have to be very, 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 um, very effective in terms of mobilizing, getting people to cooperate. And, and as you know, Dr. Merck, uh, political scientists, we always talk about cooperation. <laughs> my new book about my new book on world government or uh, global public government is, is, is collect, collective action problems, right? It's just so difficult to get people to take collective action, to work together, to cooperate. So a leader has to be very skilled, very skillful to be able to maneuver in such a way that bring people together but at the, same, at the same time, keep them in line, right? And that is not easy. And that is not easy. But I, I think, I hope that the new leadership will be able to unite the country because it's heartbreaking to me to see this politics of survival continue because it, it's nasty. And uh, it, it's not good for the country when people demonize each other. Let's stop demonizing each other. Let's talk about common problems. What, are, what, what is the biggest common problem that we have? I would say the lack of institution and the security dynamic. Let's look at the problem, not on people. The moment you leaders keep demonizing each other, who's the bad guy? Who's the good guy? Who's, the, you know, nice, uh, who's, the, who's right, who's wrong? you will now not get out of this security, what I call insecurity dilemma, because people fear each other. The moment you demonize me, I don't want to cooperate with you. You have to find a way out together. Otherwise, fragile stability is a cycle of violence, peace, peace, violence, uh, and, and, and on and on and on up to 30 years. We still have not a very, uh, we don't still have, we still don't have a very stable country. Um, and, and for me, as someone who uh, have observed Cambodia for a long time, each time I see this, it's, it, it breaks my heart. 
uh, and that's why I don't engage. I don't engage in 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 uh, being. I just want Cambodian people to realize their common problems and start working together to solve them. Uh, an excellent point, and and thank you uh, for a remarkably, a wonderfully thorough overview here, uh, and uh, on this particular question. Uh, and really noting, I mean, as we know in political science, for anyone other than a consolidated liberal democracy, and there's there's not a huge number of those uh, floating around uh, globally, or particularly here in Southeast Asia, uh, leadership transition is always uh, a, a, an enormous challenge, and mm -hmm. and and can create the significant levels of instability. And we've seen the Singapore model being proposed as a potential approach. Uh, but all, uh, quite interesting. Um, on the question here, just I'll, I'll, I think this is sort of our, our uh, last one, or we might have time for one more if someone wants to try to get one in, just building off of just the second portion of the last question we still have in the chat, uh, which is something of an extension uh, to what you've been discussing um, uh, in the last question, um, was uh, asking about concrete mechanisms for strengthening sec security dynamics in Cambodia. Um, now, to me, it sounds as though, and I really found quite interesting, the idea of a new social contract uh, or a new social agreement, et cetera, and obviously the importance of, of, of with that, with building on institutions. I, I want to add a bit of a twist to this as well, is is because you did mention, and in, and in political science, we're, we care enormously about questions of social trust and societal trust and how to rebuild trust. Um, so I, I'm, I'm curious if, if, is the lack of social trust in Cambodia sort of causally prior to any new social contract or institutionalization? Do we need to uh, take even a further step back before we think about institutions uh, and think about questions of, of social trust or, or how to rebuild that trust uh, that, that was uh, obviously so, so damaged? I mean, at the same time, that's an enormous undertaking that, that uh, in political science, I mean, we certainly don't have the, have the skill set uh, to, to write a prescription simply and say, do X, Y, and Z, and, and you can rebuild social trust. Uh, so sorry, a lot, a lot there, but we've got. We, but, uh, but I think it's probably going to be our last one. So, uh, and any final remarks uh, that you might have uh, would be splendid, sir. Yeah, you know, I would say, you know, uh, so far, especially Western donors tend to put a lot of emphasis on the role of civil society, right? As a as a, as a, as a, as a, a new it's a branch of government to, <laughs> to, to bring about democracy and, and stability and peace. I think what, the, what, what is missing here, that kind of framework, and a lot of people like to, you know, like to debate with me, is that you have to build civil society first. You know, uh, the problem is that when elite politics is still driven by survival politics, the, the, the need to survive. Uh, civil society cannot grow. Civil society cannot grow. And I, you know, you and I, as political scientists, we understand the problem of power <laughs> than, than activists. Activists always, you know, civil society, civil society. If the political elite cannot agree, reach a kind of accommodation or, you know, come up with a social contract, the struggle of power at the top level will have a great negative effect on civil society. Civil society will never grow, will never, will never, will never thrive. So the first important and most important thing is for the Cambodian elites, the leaders of different parties, especially the, the major parties, to, to really think more carefully about what can be done. From what I have heard so far worries me. All I have heard from the opposition party, for instance, is that we need to have free and fair elections, <laughs> right? We have to uh, go back to the Paris Agreement. Well, the response so far has been no. You know, the prime minister said the Paris Agreement is dead, right? Now, yes, the Paris Agreement laid a good foundation, but it's no longer viable in a, in, in a realistic sense. In a sense that, as I pointed out before, before the role of the extra great powers and the balance of power structure and things like that were in place, but now it's a hegemonic power structure. You cannot say free and fair election, otherwise we don't talk, right? All we want is free and fair election. The hegemonic party system does not allow it. What can 
what is possible. This is why realists, uh, like you and me, we talk about being realistic and not being idealistic, is that in a hegemonic power system or hegemonic party system, the hegemonic party will never go for free and fair election. Simply put, because the hegemonic party has been dominant for some time and unpopular generally. And, and, and the perception of the hegemonic party leadership is that it might lose. Free and fair, fair election does not work. And remember in 2013, just we had a little bit of free and fair election that led to, you know, CNRP getting a lot of seats. Boom, after that, what happened, right? Uh, the next election, what happened, right? The dominant party would not allow free and fair election if it think that it would lose, right? So the opposition party has to be more realistic and say, I'm not going to vote, I'm not going to participate, I'm not going, I'm, uh, you know, I, I will call for the destruction of the, the dominant party. It's not going to work because that's what we call it real politics. Real is power. If you don't understand that, you're not going to go very far. And what happened is that you, the more you demand that and the more you fail in getting what you want, the problem is that the opposition fragmented in fighting because there is a disagreement because it's not, if, it, you, if a party is not successful, it's going to go down the drain, right? That's why it's important from my perspective that the CPP, the, the leadership have to make sure that the party succeed. And if it doesn't succeed, it will disintegrate. And that is the problem. That's part of what I call the politics of survival. If you don't survive, you will die more or less, right? So that's why the opposition party has to be realistic. You cannot expect the dominant party to hold free and fair election and lose, possibly lose. This electoral process, electoral, uh, electoral process, uh, free and fair election, it's not realistic. I think the first thing you need to do is to negotiate, right? The, the opposition party might have to be willing to say, okay, come, we come, we have elections, but you know, we're not, we're not going to try to, to win or, or do anything to overthrow you or to drive you out of power. Otherwise, it's this, that, that, that strategy would be counterproductive. So I think it, it has to be based on trust building first, because if you don't, tr if, if, if the dominant party doesn't trust your motive, that your motive is to, overthrow or to drive out the dominant party, you're going to see a lot of blood. You're going to see a lot of instability. You're going to see a lot of tension. And that's what Cambodia has gone through so far, right? So I don't know, I haven't followed Cambodian politics in the last year or two because I've been writing books on regional security and global politics. I, I don't follow, but the impression that I have, uh, uh, I have, I have, uh, uh, have received is that it's not going well, right? You know, the dominant party will allow 100 parties as long as none of them is capable of overthrowing it. The moment someone, some party threatened to undermine the dominant party, that will be the end of it. So you need the mechanism that allow people room to, to move slowly and be strategic don't have to win in the next election, but you can start building your own party. The problem with Cambodian opposition party is that they are empty shells. And even if you win, what can you do? And that's why you perpetuate that cycle. Uh, uh, this idea that because I'm a good guy, I will run the country without being corrupt, <laughs> nonsense. When the politics survival, when you face your end at the politics survival, when you become the ruling party, or the, 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 when you form a new government, the politics survival required that you become corrupt in order to consolidate power. The same old thing, it go on and on and on and on. So I don't trust one person, I don't trust anyone who can say, I am the good guy. If I am in power, I will make all the difference. Nonsense. Uh, that is um, delusional. So in that sense, we need to have a social contract that say, let's work together, let's build the country together, let's not compete uh, to try to, you know, win, win or take all kind of approach. Let's have 
you know, an agreement that the opposition party may not may, may be allowed to win some seat, but not all the seat, uh, that the hegemonic party is, will be allowed to continue to rule and then uh, work things out along the way, find a common way. But it's just difficult uh, to have good leadership when, good, uh, when leaders always demonize each other. I try not in all my work, I have never demonized anybody. Uh, I never demonize anybody. Although some scholars demonize me, I never respond back because uh, it's, not, it's not for me gentleman-like, but it's not, it's not professional. So in that sense, Cambodian leaders need to think very carefully about just the extreme politics of survival, the culture of retribution. We need to really relax a little bit. And, and, and the question is always find the right people to do it. You know, the question of trust is, is uh, the, the problem of trust is, is extreme. I can trust you tomorrow, today. This is what good realists would say, but tomorrow you might become enemy, right? My enemy. So it's just difficult to trust. And one, one, one moment of anger can destroy the whole thing, trust, right? So do you have leaders who are patient? Do you have leaders who are objective and, and, and professional, who, who can look thing, at things in, a, in a, a more calm, collected way? I just find it difficult to, to, I can't find too many of them. And that is the problem. I think we need to nurture the new generation about the need to be professional, to be objective, to be not, not too partisan, uh, thinking about the destruction of survival politics and look for a way out together as a people, as a nation, to build institutions that will help the countries uh, enjoy long lasting peace. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarpon Pugh. An excellent note on which to end and, and very much appreciate today um, as we are out of time. And I know we have a couple of questions in the queue, um, but it's uh, already 1030 here in Phnom Penh and 1030 p.m. Uh, in Toronto. Uh, so and in D.C. So we don't want to be holding people uh, too late. Uh, let me just take a moment to again, thank uh, Dr. Sarpon Pugh uh, for a real tour de force. Uh, and an absolutely brilliant uh, presentation and discussion uh, that well inaugurates uh, this uh, Dr. Betty Widiono uh, lecture series uh, organized by uh, Center for Khmer Studies, uh, co-hosted by Paragot International University. Um, before folks log off, please, I'd like to encourage you um, if, 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 if you're looking for, uh, and it's just put come up in the chat box, um, the book, Dancing in the Shadows, Sihanouk the Khmer Rouge and the United Nations in Cambodia. Um, which was written by Dr. Betty Widiono. Um, and here you can see in the chat box, if you're joining us via Zoom, is uh, the link uh, for the Khmer and English, uh, English versions. So the English version, you can, if you're uh, in the US or in Canada, you can of course uh, buy online, uh, but CKS does have a Khmer language version uh, available. So uh, in the spirit and the memory of, of Dr. Betty Widiono, we strongly encourage folks to, uh, to take a read through. Uh, and of course, Dr. Sorpon Pugh is the mo re most recently the author of Peace and Security in Indo-Pacific Asia, uh, International Relations Perspectives in Context, and his forthcoming book, uh, Global Public Governance Toward World Government. Uh, let's add the question mark at the end. It's, it's, it's a question rather than an assertion. Uh, and I'm sure, uh, I know I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, and if you have a chance to pick those up, uh, uh, it's, uh, when the new uh, book comes out, highly recommend. Oh, Dr. Pugh, please. Just one quick point. In celebration of uh, Dr. Widuno's work, I would say, we Cambodian, let's have, you know, fun, joke around, you know, relax and don't get too tense. <laughs> because I think for me, I enjoy having conversation with him because it's always fun to talk to him. So let us learn to talk to each other in a fun way and not in an angry way all the time. And appropriate words on a Friday as well. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, again, uh, let me thank you, Dr. Sarpam Q. Uh, again, let me thank Dr. Eve Zucker and the entire team at CKS and all of the participants who joined us today, uh, particularly the Widiono family, uh, who we're very honored to have here uh, as we mark this inaugural lecture. Uh, on behalf of myself and Paragon International University, uh, thank you so much for joining, uh, and we look forward to seeing you at future CKS and Paragon events, as well as next year's uh, Widiono lecture. So with that, thank you very much and have a wonderful day or a wonderful, uh, wonderful rest.
Good night. Thank you. Good night.